the Roman festival of Floralia. What was it? And is there any link with May Day or Bell Tape? Stay tuned to find out. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Pucca and welcome to my symposium. I'm a PhD and a university lecturer, and it is your online resource for the academic study of magic, paganism, shamanism, and all things esoteric. In today's video, I will be exploring the Roman festival of Floralia, part of a talk that I gave for the Dorin Valiente Foundation in the UK. So I'd like to thank the Dorin Valiente Foundation and Julie for being an amazing organizer and for inviting me, which was really a pleasure. So I hope you will enjoy this talk and let me know what you think in the comment section. On to the talk now. So today I will be talking to you about the Floralia, also called the Ludi Floralis, uh, which is a, which used to be and still is, as we will see, um, a Roman festival, a festival of the Roman religion. So the things that I will be covering in this talk are the first, of course, the festival of Floralia, in ancient Rome, but also I will be mentioning the contemporary uh, practice of, um, of this kind of festival and similar festivals. I'd say similar festivals because the Floralia is not as um, celebrated by contemporary uh, pagans in, in Italy because there are, especially around Rome, um, in general in Italy you have uh, pagan reconstructivist movements and it is most common that in the south you will find um, Hel Hellenistic reconstructivist, reconstructivist movements or Etruscan reconstructivist movements, whereas in Rome and in the Midlands you will find Roman uh, ones, and in the north you will have you will find more interest in the Celtic religions. Also, I will be mentioning, the, um, which I, I find to be quite interesting and something that people usually don't know, there is actually a, a difference between the way uh, Romans and uh, Greeks used to perceive deities and, um, yeah, and, and build festivals around them. And also I will be, uh, by the end of it, we will see and address possible parallels between uh, May Day and Bel Beltane or Vieltene and um, the Roman festival of Floralia. As for my methodology, I have used textual sources and the references would be at the, at the end as the, the last slide. But also I, since I, I do anthropological research and I study contemporary paganism. I couldn't help it but, <laughs> um, you know, contacting and reaching out to those who actually who are nowadays still performing um, these sort of Roman festivals, and they are trying to um, celebrate these Roman festivals according to the um, to, to the sources that they find, and it's absolutely fascinating to see how they select the sources and how they find the, that they try to find accurate information, but then at the same time, they want to bring the Roman festivals and these traditions to the contemporary world. And so there is still a way of adapting to the contemporary world, but at the same time, trying to keep certain key elements um, true to their original uh, context and meaning. So yeah, uh, part of the information that is con that will be conveyed in this uh, in this talk is it is also drawn from uh, interviews to contemporary practitioners, and a few notes here is that whenever sources are unclear or disagree, I will favor the version provided by my interviewees, and also I have uh, favored sources in Italian and Latin. I have to therefore thank a lot May Rega, who is a uh, capo tribus of the Comunitas Populi Romani, and that is one of these groups in Rome. And the other person that I'd like to thank is Marzio Emanuele Viotti, who belongs to, the, uh, to another group called uh, Ad Maiora. One of the things that we need to uh, clarify and highlight when it comes to Roman festivals and even 
the Roman religion in general, is that there is a difference between private and public religious festivals. In fact, it may be even debated and debatable whether it, it was a, a religion that, that, you know, the Roman traditions that were uh, happening at the time um, from the, the birth of Rome and, you know, from the time we have any record until the Christianization of the empire. And that is the time span that um, the even contemporary pagans will use as the, uh, the, the, the historical time uh, where they can source material and text and information to, uh, to, to draw the information for, for the festivals that they will celebrate. So it is also debatable whether it is a religion or other set of religious practices. And you will have that there is this, uh, it, it is interesting because you will find both festivals that are private, that are celebrated within the, you know, the, the privacy of the home or with family. And then you will have public festivals, which were spectacular and also uh, played a role in, the, um, in society. So they, were, they weren't just religious, but they were also integrated in one way or another into the, um, yeah, the, the social and societal fabric. Uh, so in some cases, and as we will see, um, that happens with the Floralia as well, they will they also try to convey a certain morale or a certain message so interestingly deities we sometimes we tend to think of the roman deities as very anthropocentric so they will resemble human beings in one way or another both because they are females or males or because they have certain characteristics that we associate to um, to a human person, uh, but actually, in the before the, the the slow and steady Hellenization of the Roman culture, deities were seen more as forces in nature. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say, as far as to say that it was more animistic, although it may sound like it because, for example, uh, Jupiter would have been seen more as uh, the thunder and as this force in nature rather than as the person, the, the, the deity, um, the god that was represented from a certain point onwards. And the anthropomorphism uh, that was that then attached to, to deities, to the Roman deities, comes from Greece and from uh, the Greek culture and from the statues and the, and the mythology that slowly but steadily penetrated the Roman culture. And so that became also an aspect that reshaped, um, once again, slowly, it wasn't just, you know, something that suddenly happened, but something that over time and progressively occurred. Also, uh, festivals um, were, uh, were seen and uh, practiced and engaged with as a way of marking the rhythm of the year and as an expression of religiosity. Uh, oh, here uh, we will refer mostly to one specific uh, Roman calendar because there are quite a few and even if you look look them up on, on the internet you will find different Roman calendars. But the, the calendar that even contemporary practitioners of the Roman religion will use is the one by uh, Numa Pompilius and it is uh, also called a Luni Solar Calendar because it is based both on the moon and the sun. More specifically, months are lunar um, related to the moon and years are solar related to the sun. And you have three main, um, three core moments in the, in the month, in the uh, calendar that is used by uh, the calendar of Numa Pompilius and the one that is used by contemporary Roman practitioners, um, more specifically uh, the ones that I mentioned earlier and the, the ones that I interviewed, they told me that they will base their festivities and their festivals on this um, lunisolar calendar. And so the calends will be the new moon, 
the nuns will be the first quarters of each month and then you will have the ides which are um, which will fall uh, when the full moon happens contemporary practitioners especially the uh, comunitas populi romani use the aforementioned calendar and roman festivals up until the Christianization of the empire. So that is, there is a very wide spanning history, we may say. So as for the Floralia, also called the Ludi Floralis, we see that the Ludi of the Great Mother, uh, both uh, Ceres and Flora, uh, occupied almost two thirds of the month of April. In fact, April was quite strongly dedicated to um, goddesses um, related to fertility, whereas um, we would see that March tends to be more dedicated towards, we may say, male gods who are uh, related to uh, war and uh, warfare. Although it, it is also important to, to say that the fact that deities came to be anthropomorphized, they became um, seen as human beings, came later and under the influence of the Greek culture. And so when you see, when you have that as a premise and you see that the Roman understanding of deities was more that of forces in nature and forces in even in human people, um, forces in general that, you, that are part of our experience and of our surrounding world, then uh, even the gender of deities is something that is it is not quite the same as the gender of human beings. It is more related to a certain certain symbolic elements that, that you would associate to female and male rather than uh, their, them being actually female or male. In fact, there are certain de Roman deities that, will, that you will find that over the course of history have moved from being female, from being represented as female to being male and vice versa, or being both of them. Uh, it's not that they had trans transgender deities at the time, it is just that the way they perceived the gender of deities was not the way that they would see the gender in, in people. So, um, yeah, the first occurrence that we find of the Floralia is in the um, 241 or the 238 BCE. The Ludi were comp competitions and circus performances that constituted the appendix of almost all the Roman celebrations in ancient times. So you would have the celebration and then at the end of it, you will have this Ludi, these um, competitions and circus performances. And uh, when it comes to the Floralia, one of its characteristics is that uh, people could engage in explicit behavior in public. Uh, so as we will see, uh, the Floralia are very explicit <laughs> uh, as festivals. Uh, they were celebrated from the 28th of April until the 3rd of May. Of course, this depends on the calendar, uh, but yeah, using the Julian calendar, uh, this would be the, the dates. The Floralis, which is another name for uh, this festivity, weren't really ordinary games. They were rather a parody of circus games. Instead of gladiators, there were prostitutes, and instead of fighting against beasts, the latter fought against hares and goats. Instead of, instead of male athletes, prostitutes competed with each other in all kinds of competitions. In fact, Christian authors have often used the florales to demonstrate the immorality of the pagan religion, for example, uh, games of the more devout are the, the, mo the more vile. I translated from the Italian here, and, um, or in from Latin, uh, and uh, the brothel moved into the theater. So the month of April um, was seen as the female equivalent of the month of March. This is something that I was also mentioning earlier, whose rituals address the natural virility of the militia as a cultural expression of virility. 
you find here compared the maternal function of females to the military function of males, to which the April rights addressed the natural female sexuality, thus transforming it into cultural. So there is a way here to, of addressing the female sexuality in a way that is detached from um, maternity, in a way, from uh, motherhood. Prost prostitutes meant natural female sexuality, sex for sex, as opposed to the matrons who represented the perfect cultural condition of the Roman woman. So the matrons would be the you know the, the women that would dedicate themselves to marriage and um, and having children, whereas the prostitutes are those who just devote themselves to sex for sex. That's how they they would see that. So the Ludi Florales had the, these prostitutes engaged in martial arts um, and saw in that the, the possibility that um, even the female sexuality, like virility could be addressed to the, um, um, in comparison to the militia, but in fact, they express it to the night. So it was like they were trying to, um, they had much dedicated to the military forces and to the male virility. And then they would have April, especially the latter part of April, dedicated more to female sexuality, but female sexuality in and of itself, which was represented by the prostitutes, but it was also vilified in a way because they were trying to say, oh, see, men are actually fighting, whereas they are not fighting. They are just, um, you know, trying to, you know, <laughs> catch uh, goats, but uh, not even managing to do that. So it was a way of vilifying um, the, the roles of prostitutes, um, yeah, in, in a way. So um, the idea here is that if most women can fight against hares and goats and in circus, in circus competitions, they, they do not show the masculine strength, uh, but uh, lasciviousness. What we find here in this kind of festivity is an ambiguity that uh, is found in, in the Roman culture of the time with regards to prostitution in general. Um, because, um, yeah, in a way, in the way uh, in which um, they, they took note of prostitution in, um, in the Roman state, because um, Romans controlled it without repressing it. And once a year, it reduced prostitution to a game rather than an object of indignation or lust. And also, once a year, he, um, they used prostitutes for a parody show. So the idea here is that um, they saw the prostitutes as the, um, not quite as the counterpart of the male um, militaries, but rather as, um, a, a, as a way of saying, so you have refused your role as a female. And so the other kinds of people that refuse that role, you know, to dedicate themselves to motherhood and um, being a matron are men, but men do so because they go out and fight. So can you fight? Are you able to fight anything? And so it was a way of displaying that they couldn't really. And so that they were just about, you know, having sex and uh, it was just sex for, for the sake of it. The celebration saw a combination of various elements then. So you have the, the dialectic between the matron and the prostitute, uh, which is operating in the archaic um, festive cycle of the month of April. And then you have the character of the month of, um, of the Ludi that April took on after the, um, uh, the plebeian appropriation of the Cerealia or Cerealia, which is the festivities for the, the goddess uh, Ceres, which is connected to, to the grain. And then you have the establishment of builders and builders are those who assist the festivity of Cerealia to begin with. Um, and so it is interesting because you do find the goddess Flora 
before the establishment of the, before the, the first occurrence of the festival of Floralia. But um, as we will see, the goddess Flora was perceived in a very different way. And then, um, as we saw later on, you will have these builders who are uh, connected to, um, to, yeah, who are part of the, the common people, the commoners, we, we could say. And they established this uh, festivity because uh, there, at that time in the Roman history, the builders also became magistrates. And so there was this connection between the two because uh, since the builders at that time also became part of, became magistrates, they, also, they had to deal with both prostitutes and the games. And so it was like the two were collated in a way to, you know, to, to an, sort of show a display of sexuality, but at the same time, having this underlying condemnation of it or um, yeah showing the the fact that it was just um, sexuality for for the sake of it so sabatini claims that flora was invented together with the uh, florales uh, just to give those games a divine title according to the polytheistic usage this impression would be also corroborated by the fact that the temple of the goddess who stood near the uh, Circus Maximus was erected on the initiative of the same two publici who had organized the first execution of the Florales. Also, we see that in Ovid, uh, in Ovid's Fasti, which is another book that is taken, that is used as a, a key, a core reference for those who still practice today the Roman pagan religion. Uh, Ovid, in order to give Flora some consistency as a deity, because you don't find really as many myths on, on Flora and her role as a, as a goddess in the Roman pantheon, Ovid had to propose um, as it, it appeared that um, Flora was not really a goddess that came from Rome, but from outside. Ovid proposed that um, Flora came from a Greek myth of which the, the goddess uh, is a protagonist. So for Ovid, the name Flora is a Latin derivation of the Greek name Chloris, recurring in various myths, but never to indicate a real goddess. Flora Chloris, um, i.e. The, the green, cultivates prodigious herbs um, and especially those with um, that have a magical power and can create magical filters. And they um, are under the realm of the goddess Venus, which is also quite interesting because um, there is a connection with um, fertility and procreation, but as we will see with Flora, it's not procreation through mating or coupling, but procreation in a very different way. Juno uh, goes to Flora asking for a herb that makes her uh, have a, a child without mating. She wants to do that to make the, the match for Jupiter, because Jupiter did the same uh, with, um, without coupling, he created Athena, he created uh, Minerva, uh, and uh, she sprang out of his head without uh, him having to procreate with another, with Juno or Hera, because it's a Greek myth, and according to Ovid, from this Greek myth, you have the, the, the goddess uh, Flora in the, um, in the Roman religious culture. So Flora Chloris gives the right herb to Juno, who gives birth to Mars or Ares, and Mars compensates Flora by assuring her a place in the city of Rome. There is a, a very ancient altar of Flora, whose erection was even traced back to Titus Tatius, uh, the Sabine who, who would have reigned together with, uh, with Romulus. There is also another myth reported in Sabatini, this uh, historian and anthropologist that I was mentioning earlier, according to which when Romulus founded Rome, he gave the city three names, one secret or initiatory, one sacral or, or liturgical, and one political. 
and the sacral name or sacred or sacred name of Rome would be Flora. So the institution of the Floralia marked the birth of a renewed goddess connected to giving birth without mating. And so that may have been a link to the idea of prostitution. Perhaps I may add that um, it could be also connected to the fertility of the earth in springtime, uh, since we see that, um, you know, the, the abundance that we see uh, and the plenty that we see in springtime is not really connected to a male and female mating, but it is still, you still see creation and birth around you and rebirth in a way. Um, so it may be also connected to that. And also, uh, and also Flora is connected to the birth of Rome, which occurred on the 21st of April. Now to answer our question, are there connections between the festival of Floralia and May Day or uh, Beltane? Perhaps there may be more parallels than there are links or connections, um, especially because there is a lack of a lack of sources that would connect would strongly connect these festivities and also because we are talking about a very wide um, historical span there is as i was mentioning no sound historical evidence to my knowledge uh, of a direct link between uh, beltane and floralia so it is more likely that there was an influence and some of the roman traditions were combined with those existing in britain at the time uh, that is the the most likely case which i have found um, I have found uh, studies on that, but it, it tends to be, it always tends to be quite vague. So the idea is that around that time, uh, around springtime, you do have a, across different cultures, rites and festivals related to rebirth and birth and procreation and fertility. And they have, they translate differently and they have different ritualisms. But that kind of uh, underlying tone is more or less the same. So, but there isn't really a strong connection in terms in terms of ritualism between Floralia and uh, Beltane or May Day. There are other two Roman festivals that might be also that might have played an influence in um, you know in the establishment of the festival of May Day and. Um, pagan festival of Beltane, and these two are the Lupercalia and the Parilia. The Lupercalia occur in mid-February, and they have perhaps a stronger link with sexuality, especially the sexuality that um, we tend to associate to Beltane, which is sexuality, you know, where there is an interplay of two individuals or more individuals. And, um, in the, during the Lupercalia, people were masked and, and dressed as goats and whipped for purification and to propitiate fertility. And uh, it, it was probably a rite of passage from childhood to adolescence. Uh, there are people now who associate the Lupercalia to, um, uh, to Valentine's Day, but um, it, it is, it, it, according to the sources and according to my interviewees as well they find it to be more connected to Beltane rather than Valentine's Day um, and also we have the Parilia that, that used to occur on the 21st of April and still occur for those who celebrate it and here there was the practice also present in Beltane of jumping on the fire to bless the uh, to, to bless and purify the the animals um, and um, the the pastoral products as well, so it was a way of uh, purifying and blessing. And this is it for for the talk. <laughs> I welcome your your questions, and uh, these are some references. So this is it for today's video. Hope you liked it. If you did, smash the like button. 
subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell so that you will never miss a new upload from me. And as always, stay tuned for all the academic fun. <laughs> Bye for now.